layer of control than uh, rules and policies and regulations. Um, and uh, when it comes to compete, uh, we need less competition within the organization. We can always, of course, compete with, with other organizations in the same industry, our competitors. These are maybe the companies we should use competition to be, to benchmark against their figures, to use relative goals, okay, our goal for this company is to be better than our competitors, that's a good relative goal, but we're not, we don't have a fixed goal somewhere that we have to reach, but we need to be better than them, it's a good goal that would also un unite your, your company to become better and continuously improve and continuously learn. So uh, it's a good model, I think, to think about culture and what do we want more of and what do we want less, less of. Yeah. E, e como, e como sair desse círculo vicioso, talvez que a Lúcia trouxe, do momento não favorável, de um momento financeiramente difícil, é, onde eu precisaria subir um nível, né? O, o, onde que a gente tem saídas, não sei. I think it's a awareness, uh, mainly awareness, what is happening. If we try to control more tightly, we may miss out and we may actually achieve the opposite than what our goal is. Um, to looking, looking at other companies and looking at research, hopefully, there will be research soon as well, if these two women that are working within that field are doing their job. <laughs> because there is not a lot of research today, what happens when we turn our back uh, to the figures, the numbers and the results, right? Because companies have a tendency to centralize everything when they should be decentralizing everything, right? Uh, for COVID, for example, now, Everything has to be decided by top management and the central office instead of empowering people to come up with their ideas. This is when we should use collective intelligence even more in these crisis situations or when the company is not going that well. There is an economic downturn. Now we need everybody's brains to try to solve the problem, right? But companies do the opposite, just like you're saying. But the awareness that th this may be a counterproductive behavior can, of course, help. But then you need to send your managers to uh, agile leadership training, or awareness training, coaching. That's how we say it. we change and structures and such things. Be because it's all based on fear. It's all based on. Uh, people getting scared when things aren't continuously you know improving and results curves are going up all the time it's a, it's a fear in the, in management mainly so we need to to create that psycholo psychological safety for them as well hey we are here we are here to help you don't have to grab all the power to you and to decide everything because we have a company of thousands of people who have great ideas of what we could do in this situation. Use the people in this situation instead of grabbing control and keeping it the power to yourselves. Só em continuação, continuidade desse, desse teu exercício de descentralização e de chamar pessoas para a resolução do problema, na, na prática, muitos de outras empresas, quando vou falar que parceiros novos e fora da vida, as, as uh, recomendações, elas vêm muito na oposição desse, desse pensamento. Oposição, por exemplo, de que há torres de controle, onde o processo decisório, a governança, a governança ela, ela fica mais institucionalizada, mais hierarquizada, com mais hierarquia. Mais hierarquia. Yes. É, então, é, é um trade-off de pensamento e de gestão, quando a gente é, a gente está falando isso porque a gente tá, vive esse momento mais austero em termos de resultados financeiros e as recomendações das Big Four são 
são em oposição a essa, a essa visão aqui de, de, de agilidade, de envolvimento das pessoas na solução do processo. Como que a gente consegue ter uma mediação, uma, claro, uma, uma influência, um, um, uma, uma forma, né? Então, tudo bem, eu vou ter todos os controles para grandes custos, grandes gastos, eu volto numa, num, num controle orçamentário, na de sobrevivência, está tudo certo. Mas é nessa hora como eu instalo, como eu envolvo liderança com o modelo ágil. Acho que é um, uhum. Uhum. um dilema, não sei só a gente que nada aqui, mas valioso, né? Não, e... Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, no. could I comment on that, please? Because we, we had a um, Agile in Finance course last week, and uh, the recipe is very much in decoupling the organization to the antidote to what you're just saying is to decouple the organization. That's the technical solution, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. we have one bank in Sweden, they are called Handelsbanken, and they are the bank that never went into bankruptcy or had any economic problems or whatever. They ne never needed support from, from the state, from the government, mm -hmm. because they, they were in a very big crisis in 1973, and they almost went bankrupt. And then there was this very, um, intelligent CEO who said, I will take over this company, uh, this bank, and I will turn it around. But you have to let me do this exactly as I want. And I will have all the power to decide how to do this. And the owners of the bank, they said yes, because they were facing bankruptcy. So they basically didn't have a choice. And all the people, they were facing um, unemployment if, if uh, they didn't turn around the bank. So everybody was extremely motivated to do, as this one man said, John Balander was his name. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he said, we're going to decouple the bank. We are not going to work with control and command chains anymore. We are not going to follow up uh, all the departments on, on our goals from the top management and so on. So what he did, he went from this kind of pyramid where you have this common uh, control and command top down that kind of uh, translates down the chain of command as you are very familiar with, to this kind of organization where uh, this part is responsible for strategy <coughs> and vision. You know, this is our bank's strategy. This is top management. They are not giving orders to the next level, which is then support. Support functions. This could be, for example, IT. Here is top management. This is IT, HR, finance, legal, and so on. It's not the value creating units here, but it's the ones giving support to the value creating units. Here are the bank offices. The bank offices is where we create the value for the customer, right? They are completely uh, separated, not completely separated because they, here, they um, uh, develop products and services but they are not mandatory for the offices to use. They say here are the mandatory products and services and here are some that you can use if your customer base likes them, okay? So they are self-organizing, self-managing and self-directing themselves, the different value-creating units. And they are competing against each other. Oh, now she says that competition is a good thing. I thought it was bad. No, but listen, they have a very smart system with these uh, units because they have a league table. They have somebody who is the best. They are here at the top. This is the best, uh, the bank office producing the best result, let's say, financial result. And then we have somebody at the bottom, down here. They are producing the worst result because they are comparing with the same KPIs across all offices. So why should uh, they be able to improve? Why, why should they get help from the best office 
Uh, and why should the best office want to help them down there, the bank office, who is the worst? Can you think of any reason for that? Yeah. 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 So that every person in the bank gets the same bonus uh, as everybody else. Even the CEO to the worker in the bank office, they get the same bonus. That's why when they call them to ask for help to become better, they want to help them because then we have a bigger cake to share, all of us. That's what they did. A self. Um, developing system, a self-improving system they put in place. So it's self-improving all the time. They're trying to become better and better because then the cake becomes bigger that they all share all the people in this bank. It's a very smart system. But they don't work with control and command. They are self-organizing down here to create value. And they are supporting them in the middle, and they are working with a strategy. And yes, they follow the strategy, but they, <coughs> they are not forcing results, you know, economic finance results onto to them. They're just comparing with each other and benchmarking and trying to improve all the time. And this is the way we could work. And this is theoretical, because yeah, it's working in Handelsbank, yeah. But of course, it's about psychology. When we, when we talk about managers, we have those solutions. We have these companies who work decoupled in different ways. We also have a Chinese company called Hire and a, a US company producing, they are selling uh, shoes, for example. We have many companies who work with decoupling their organizations, empowering the value creation units. But it's not about that, it's about people's psychology, it's about manager's mindset, it's about the power, the status, the money, and the position that they have worked hard for, for many, many years to get to that position they are in today. They don't want to lose that. They want the power structure to remain because they are making a profit on that. So <coughs> why should they change? Why? To create a greater whole? No. They work for themselves. It's their profit. It's their bonus. I'm thinking about myself first. Not the better of the whole company or the greater good of the company. Because then they would work. They are very well aware of these models. And that if they are not aware of these models, then it's enough just to enlighten them, just to train them, right? You go to an a finance course, Agile Finance, or an Agile Leadership course, and then voila, they will change, right? But they won't. But it's, it's not about, many times, it's not about the knowledge. They know this exists, but they don't do it. And you know very well why. What do you think? Então, o Einstein, por exemplo, na pandemia, Einstein é uma, um hospital aqui, bem famoso no Brasil. Na pandemia, eles transformaram, uh, usaram muito a parte de agilidade, né, especialmente para recrutar, enfim, enfermeiras, eles já, elas, elas já tinham aí um processo que vinha acontecendo, já conheciam um pouco da ferramenta e estavam testando. Quando veio a pandemia, 
mobilizaram né, as pessoas e usaram muito do agile para isso. Mas depois que passou também, voltou um pouco para trás. Então, acho que essa lógica de entender, né, é, no caso de vocês, vocês têm uma cultura que já é mais tradicional e hierárquica, foi a vida toda de comando e controle, por conta, inclusive, do processo produtivo. É muito crítico né, a, a siderurgia, né, assim, que eles produzem, eles têm muito controle uh, por conta de perigo né, uh, físico das pessoas. Então, é, eu acho que né, no caso de vocês, vocês se ajudando na discussão, volta, né, o que era mais forte na organização? Ah, a gente sabe operar aqui. Né, se transformar a cultura é um, uma dor, né? Como é que você vai completamente para outro lugar? O caso que a Pia Maria trouxe, olha, é o primeiro homem que disse, é assim que vai operar. Então, aí você tem um, um sponsor super forte que consegue, né? Quando você está transformando a cultura por outras pontes, você precisa conseguir a, né, o apoio de quem está lá para transformar inteiro. Então, por isso, nesse processo, talvez vocês estejam sofrendo um pouco, porque não tem um sponsor dizendo, olha, nós vamos para cá. É esse o caminho, né? E quando o Nath contou a história para a gente semana passada, ele comentou que nesse processo também muitas pessoas saíram da empresa. Porque aquele cara de banco que está acostumado com um bônus agressivo, que é um, o nosso cenário no Brasil, ele não, tá, não vai conseguir. Né? Mas aí é legal essa coisa de cima, porque, ok, aqui você não é a cultura que a gente quer criar. Yes, and, and uh, as I said, the, the, the guy in, in this bank, he had free hands to do what he needed to do. And everybody was in a crisis. That's why it was possible to change the command and control. But, but the thing is with the regulations, we have a, a lot of, there are two industries that I think of particularly when it comes to rules and regulations. And that's the bank world, the finance institutes, and it's healthcare and pharmaceutical industry. These are the two ones that are the most regulated industries. And I happen to have worked in um, one pharmaceutical company. Uh, I was uh, quality assuring a learning management system. And um, that was not my kind of uh, human drive or <coughs> need to do that because I'm not the kind of person who is very ordered and structured and, and, and follow rules and so on. But I did it because I, at the time, I had a tough time in my company, so I needed the money that came with a very a well paid consultancy assignment. So I went there and I did this work. And that was the first one, you know, you have this blue ink pen that you're assigning with and the ink stays for 10 years and it's a control process that is extremely rigid because it's patient safety in the end that might uh, suffer from this. But I must say that doing my job, I didn't pay that much attention to what I was doing because I knew that my work would be checked five times down the line. After me, there were five people quality assuring the things that I had done in the first place. Of course, I took less responsibility than I would have done if I knew that I was the only one responsible for this. And it was my head that would roll if the patient died down there. So I think sometimes putting one more layer of control does not help because then people stop being accountable for what they're doing and taking responsibility for their jobs sometimes. Yeah. And there is one more aspect that I would like to uh, enlighten here and that is the thing with uh, external rules and regulations. Yes, we have a lot of external rules and regulations. We have the FDA in the healthcare industry. We have uh, bank finance uh, control organs. We have the SOX, so you remember SOX? Oh. <laughs> and all these things. But that will not have to affect the internal rules and policies that we use in HR and management. Just because we have a lot of external rules, these are our constraints, right? Mm -hmm. But inside here, we don't have to copy that inside the organization. We can still be much more flexible inside the organization and give the control uh, uh, authorities what we, they need anyway but we have a softer, more flexible climate inside. But many times, 
uh, companies use it as an excuse. Yeah, we have so many rules and regulations, so we can't work with agility, they say. Mm -hmm. And it's just a stupid excuse, because you can work with agility, it hasn't got to do with external regulations. That's your playing field. This is the, the, the kind of constraints that you work within. All companies, uh, all businesses have constraints. It's just a little bit more in some industries. The health industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and the finance industry are uh, particularly uh, exposed to those rules and regulations. So I think it's just an excuse not to make HR and, I mean, there's no rule that says we have to have, uh, we have to measure individual performance and mm -hmm. pay large bonuses <laughs> just because we have a heavily regulated uh, external environment. Why? Yeah. Why do you have to pay large bonuses just because of that? No, you can change all that. You can work with beyond budgeting like Handelsbank, and this is a bank. They work in the couple, they are following all the rules and regulations and, and things around. They are still uh, decoupling the organization, working with self-organization and self-management and all these things that we talk about in agility. So it's a bad excuse, but very effective for the people who don't want to change and want to keep things the way they are. That's my take on, on that. Shall we uh, call?